So this talk is going to take 40 minutes. I will try to finish it by 30. Um, for the five, for the 10 minutes that we have, we can discuss something, and then if you uh, guys want to see some demos, I can add that also. Um, so uh, BPF is a so I'm going to talk about BPF today. Uh, I'll it's a introduction deep dive. So I will try to go as deep as possible, but uh, uh, as far as system calls, but not internally, such as uh, uh, mas machine instruction, SMB instructions, just system calls. Um, I'll talk about some uh, uh, use cases, some examples. Yeah. So what I do is I do I work at the performance uh, division at Red Hat, which is a research division. I focus on kernel networking. Uh, with XTP, which is a BPF use case, I'll talk about it. And sometimes when I get free time, insights, which is uh, proactively identifying issues in your system, um, events, performance benchmarking, and things like that. Um, so, yeah, BPF, why it was created, uh, forthcomings, um, then XTP, uh, and then what, what's the future with BPF, the usual. Um, so, how many people have heard about TCP dump? Can I see a raise of fans? Good, excellent. So, TCP dump is a network filter uh, which uh, helps in network debugging as well. Um, so, that's where the BPF ecosystem arrived. That that was in 1992. Um, BPF uh, virtual machine does the packet filtering for the TCP dump. That's why it was revolutionary at that time. Um, so what BPF uh, is, is a virtual machine. It's in kernel that is running inside the kernel with its own custom instru instruction set. That means it, it cannot run an entire operating system, but it, it does a specific thing. That is, uh, it does packet filtering and aggregation and returns to user space. Um, yeah, so at that time, uh, lots of packet filters were there. So why did uh, Van Jacobsen and Steve McKean created BPF? Van Jacobsen is synonym with uh, uh, saving the internet in 1990s or 80s, uh, 90s uh, for his congestion control algorithms. Uh, yeah, so why did they came up with BPF? So at that time, lots of uh, packet filters were uh, uh, filtering packets up the stack. That means all the packet has to go all the way up, and then the, uh, the filtering happen. It would require a lot of time, and yeah, it cannot handle that. So running inside the kernel, it it gave. Uh, it avoided uh, it avoided uh, context switches uh, and processing. Yeah, so this was the architecture back then. Uh, it did a uh, copy. Uh, it would uh, copy from the driver to the virtual machine, and then other packets would go to the protocol stack as usual. But uh, it, it 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 was designed to do a particular thing, just like the Unix philosophy. But uh, many people wanted to do more. We want more features. People are like that. We, we are not satisfied. We want more. Um, so that's why eBPF came across. So yeah, Plumgrid were, were the people who uh, were like, okay, uh, we want to do something with SDN and we want to get more features, need ability to pass the packet, modify the packet, blah, blah, blah. So what they introduced was they moved from 64-bit to 32-bit 30, uh, to 64-bit. Back then, 32-bit was a thing. Now it's 64-bit. Now it will be 128-bit. We'll go on. It's a technology uh, thing. Um, register increased from 2 to 10. Uh, did support added. Uh, and one uh, most important thing is uh, BPF system call was added. So this was uh, this BPF system call let. Uh, the ability to make dynamic changes means you, you have the ability to now communicate. Um, yeah, not during complete. Um, so now the new whenever you say BPF, uh, people usually mean eBPF, not the uh, original BPF that was there. Um, unless they have to say it, they will say classic BPF. So if you say BPF now, that means eBPF, extended Berkeley packet filter. So just because of the features, lots of new use cases came across. So tracing, security, networking was there, but more networking stuff came across. Uh, people are doing IR decoding, people are doing Android with something with Android. Um, yeah, lo lots of stuff are coming across. So initially, uh, BPF was a technology, a software, a piece of software. Now it's a platform. It's a platform, that's why the uh, 
the top title is the infrastructure. Um, so you can use it to do anything. It's it's eating the software world. It's taking up everything. Um, so you will uh, someday are going to encounter eBPF. The motive of this talk is to be aware of what BPF is and what BPF is going to do. What's what's it's going to uh, make an impact? Where it's going to make an impact in the ecosystem that we have today? So let's see how it works. Um, so we have a user space program. That means you write a user space program and then it, it is compiled to eBPF bytecode. Uh, and you then load it uh, using the BPF system call into a verifier. So I will talk about the uh, entire components that are here one by one. Uh, but uh, keep, keep, uh, keep in mind uh, this is that uh, the verifier then uh, pass onto the uh, virtual machine and then you have some hooks. I'll talk about everything that I'm mentioning right now, so don't worry. Um, and then it it, load, it it is loaded into the kernel, and then you have a com way of communication with maps, and then you, uh, from user space, you can uh, try to access uh, the data that you got, got from the kernel. All right, the BPF system call uh, looks something like this. You have your command. That means if you want to create something map or load the program or do something, uh, you have that and you uh, have an attribute which would take parameters for that. If you need to create a map, uh, you have an attribute for that. You have to, uh, if you have a program, you have a certain attribute uh, to that. Uh, it's a union, it's a basic C thing. And then you have a size. So maps are uh, key value data structures of different type. It can be hash, it can be maps. Uh, of uh, arrays and yeah anything. So how it does, how you can interact with it, uh, you get a file descriptor back to the map. I mean, uh, the map that you load into the kernel, you will get a file descriptor back so that you can use the file descriptor. Uh, just like if you have done file handling uh, in C, so you get a file descriptor and then you can access that file descriptor to uh, access the file, file ft.open, blah, blah, blah. Um, and you, then you have some uh, internal helper functions that helps you to uh, interact with the map because uh, I'll talk about it why. Um, so one program can have many maps and many program many maps can be abs uh, accessed by one single uh, ABPF program. The map types I just mentioned hash array um, perf event array CPU hash dev map lots lots of stuff. And there is one interesting uh, map type uh, program array means uh, you can uh, uh, it's not possible to do tail calls uh, as in uh, looping in uh, BPF programs because of the verify instruction I'll talk about it as well uh, but you can chain uh, programs back to back and but there is a limit as well so you can only chain up to 32 programs uh, so that you can have more features to the program all right, um, so internally it looks something like this. There are tools and there are libraries, there are wrapper libraries to ease the uh, way you write an EBA program, but this is how internally it looks like, as in um, still system calls. This gets converted into system call as well. The BPF create map, uh, I'm just showing you how the uh, uh, attribute matches to the uh, call. So map type, uh, key size, and value, and number of entries, and yeah, things like that. Um, and then you access the maps where the internal fu functions, uh, such as lookup and update. Um, and then you have helper functions. So helper functions are there in the kernel. They are there to ease out the things that you cannot do easily uh, with just a couple of functions. So it's a bit hard to do it with eBPF. So there are a couple of uh, functions that eases the, eases the way you communicate with maps. So uh, that's why uh, there are BPF lookup uh, elements and update elements. There are lots of help functions to ease out the task uh, that you cannot do normally. And then you have program types. So why do we have program types is that BPF uh, have uh, hooks into a lot of uh, subsystem. It will be security, it will be networking, it will be uh, for tracing, k probes, trace points, u probes. Lots of hooks are there. You can create your own hook and get it merged into the kernel. 
So whenever uh, an event is triggered and you have a hook uh, into the kernel event, that would mean that uh, whenever the program is run, it would uh, execute that BPF program and uh, you would get, uh, it would do the processing and then it would return back uh, to where the hook was executed last. Just like a function call, you call the function and then it moves there and then it uh, finish executing and then comes back. Uh, if, you're, if you're aware of k-probes, uh, it works some, similar to that. Um, you have program types, uh, socket filter, k-probes, xtp, cgroups, lots of them. There are many coming. Uh, people are uh, making more and more and more for their own use cases. Um, so with load program, there's the system call uh, that converts to finally to system call. But yeah, this is something like this and you have a uh, file descriptor so you can uh, manage the program. Um, but it's running inside the kernel. So many people will hesitate to run uh, something inside the kernel. So is it running inside a virtual machine? Uh, would that make it safe? Uh, I don't think so. So for that, uh, making sure your program is safe and executes uh, in a safe manner, you have a verifier which does uh, memory checks and checks for the program termination. That means the program executes in a finite time, and because uh, so that the kernel doesn't uh, loop. So you have uh, cyclic checks, um, and then uh, for the step two, you have you have a simulation where each of the stack changes are checked for and uh, made sure that okay. Um, there are no uninitialized uh, uh, registers, um, yeah, things like that. There are also work going on for loops, which is called bounded loops, uh, but it's under progress so that BPF supports uh, uh, loops, which is a basic programming feature. So yeah, uh, this is how the architecture uh, looks like uh, that I just uh, tried to explain. Um, so you have the BPF, uh, BPF uh, system call which would load the program into the verifier and the verifier would load the program and then uh, according to the program types you have certain hooks. If it's a tracing hook, it will trace to the uh, event, kernel event that you're trying to access and then uh, you have, uh, it will run inside the virtual machine and then you have some data uh, like what, what's happening inside the uh, kernel and then you have uh, BPF maps, you can do uh, you can read uh, you can read the data that you have or you can do more processing if you if you make use of the data let's say um, if you're trying to set up a load balancer maybe um, you can see the data okay uh, something is wrong and then you change the configuration uh, or a kernel parameter that might be required when uh, you have high load and when you have low load I'm just giving an example you can do a lot of stuff so how to use you need to have the updated kernel, get as much uh, newer kernel as possible. Um, the features are added uh, step by step and uh, more features are coming in. Uh, yeah. So the original BBF uh, looked something like this. You have a C program fragment uh, and then you would load the program with sec socket op. Uh, yeah, so this is not... Uh, writable or readable. I mean, this this is what the, uh, if you try to do TCP dump, hyphen I, port number would convert to a C program. So you would not want to do that. That's why TCP dump is there. And then you have eBPF, which is uh, still messy. And then uh, people try to uh, ex uh, add support, uh, LVM for backend support. That would mean you can write uh, uh, limited restricted C. Uh, with eBPF, so whatever that this code is here is equal to this code, so it 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 simplifies the code uh, more. And then you have more wrappers, more way to write uh, BCC program, uh, BPF programs. You can write in Python, Lua, Go. People are writing lots of tools in Go. Um, yeah, you have uh, you have an uh, in uh, inline C code, but then you would do the processing uh, in Python. Uh, So these are some of the BCC tools that people have written for tracing. This is for specific for tracing. This was 2017. You can do a lot of stuff uh, safe. So these tools are much, much less invasive than the existing tools used for tracing, such as, uh, um, let's say, you want to do uh, get host, uh, trying to find a time a DNS query takes. 
So what you can do is uh, possible. So I'll just do. Yeah, in that case, you can see the latency. So you can configure the tool in any way you want. This is under 200 lines of Python code and C code. Uh, so you can write your own tools as well. And uh, as compared to the other tools, which which does similar to that, uh, similar to what uh, this tool is doing, um, they have to make uh, communication with the user space and then back to kernel space. But this, uh, but this one, since it's running inside the kernel, the context switches are very less. Um, so in that case, uh, it's less invasive. You won't have uh, uh, overhead of running a monitoring tool on your system. Yeah, and uh, it's so easy to write a tool uh, that uh, uh, Brendan Gregg, who is uh, is synonym with uh, performance. Um, he wrote a tool. He wrote the uh, tools in red for his new book that is uh, that has uh, released just now. If you are into performance and improving the performance product, you should uh, uh, purchase that book or get a copy. Um, yeah, so it's so easy to write a tool that uh, people can pick up and uh, uh, get it done. There was a case that I read yesterday uh, about. Uh, Self storage. So somebody was trying to debug uh, uh, the block I/O latency, the, the time it takes to uh, write to disk. Um, so, so they were seeing that there was some issue with Ceph, uh new new cache storage, and they they were seeing very high latency suddenly with the new Ceph platform. And uh, w w upon debugging, they thought, okay, uh, this might be uh, Ceph issue, the new uh, cache issue. Uh, Implementation would be there, uh, so ke they kept on debugging. So in the buff, we were also discussing that most of the monitoring that we see in the graphs and uh, the metrics that we see may not point to the exact issue that's on the system. So we have to go to the system and see what's what's happening. So this this was a similar example. Um, so what they were, they uh, upon debugging, they found out that it was not self issue, but it was a kernel issue. Uh, it was queuing up uh, some uh, uh, writes. Uh, for no reason apparently, so they were able to patch the kernel and fix that issue. Um, so yeah, using the, this uh, this tool, it's it's pretty easy to uh, find uh, and pinpoint the issue. Um, yeah, I think OPIC will just heard my. Um, so BPF trace is a high level uh, DSL means you can write even more easier. Uh, Easy to write programs. That means you can write just like SQL. You have select statement, uh, which is uh, pretty easy. You have uh, BPF trace that gets converted to even uh, single line uh, scripts. So this one does uh, um, the syscall sys enter. So it would find it would count the uh, number of programs that uh, did a system call. So you can trace that, uh, or you can write it in a script so that you can get a format. Uh, on your own, maybe the uh, may uh, you can uh, as this program is trying to find is the number of uh, is the top ten uh, system calls has been performed in the system. Um, yeah, if you are aware of System Tap, uh, most Red Hatters here might know. Uh, re uh, recently, the three point two version converts to BPF internally. So, System Tap, uh, you have to um, uh, reload the kernel. But in this case, it seems it's running inside the virtual machine. We won't have to do that anymore. Um, all right. So, moving on to next segment, which is networking. Uh, I focus on XTP at uh, Red Hat. Um, so, it's an uh, eBPF uh, hook. That means it's an eBPF program that is running uh, running very early in the network stack. That means just the packet uh, reaches the driver, it, it uh, kicks in and start to do the packet filtering. Um, the stack uh, looks something like this. You have your network hardware that is the drivers and uh, immediately XTP is uh, invoked if, if an XTP program is there and then uh, the SK buff is built. And then somewhere uh, at layer 3, layer 4, you have IP layer, TCP layer, 
Um, so the good thing about uh, XTP is that it doesn't bypass the network stack, but aims to work with it. Uh, so that that would mean that you have all the features and security features that you have with the kernel, the existing uh, headers and all the structures you have that. Unlike other uh, performance, high performance data parts such as CPTK, which have to implement its own uh, uh, protocol and all the RT stuff. Um, yeah. So you have a couple of uh, actions which are drop, pass, TX, and redirect. Um, so this mimics something uh, called as IP tables. If you have heard about IP tables, I'm I, I'm sure you might all have, you might have. Um, so, IP tables uh, does uh, something like this. Uh, it, it accept or pass or it has a lot of features like that. So, XTP also tries to mimic what it's doing. Um, yeah. So, we were trying to do some uh, scenario testing with uh, IP tables comparing with uh, it with XTP. Um, we are using the newest kernel um, with uh, for, for uh, testing this scenario out, um, some of the system configuration we have uh, 40 gigs dual port card. Uh, we are running 4.18. Uh, yeah. So the test setup looks something like this. You have we have two systems connected back to back. That is connected back to back with wires, and we are sending traffic stream both ways. That means uh, traffic generator is sending uh, traffic from both uh, the NIC interface at a very high speed. Um, and at the uh, interface and the Thanks so much. Um, so, yeah, we have uh, one time we try to load the IP table program, and then uh, we second time we try to load XTP program, and then we ran the test. Uh, the traffic flow is uh, both ways, and we have a set of uh, um, uh, threshold that needs to be maintained for packet drops. That means it's uh, if it's above 0.002 percent, that means the test fails. So we have to ensure that uh, packet drops doesn't happen because it's a DDoS scenario. Um, so we are simply dropping the TCP streams. This is a very initial test, and then we are passing the UDP uh, packets, and we are measuring on the uh, traffic generator how many packets have been received back. It's a forwarding test. Um, so the results were something like this. We, with IP tables, we were able to closely reach 1.33 million packets per second. Um, this is for a single CPU, single queue. And with XTP, we were able to reach 5.59, close to 5.6 uh, million packets per second. Uh, and then for scaling, we tried to measure how it performs in multi queue. Uh, yeah, so this, this uh, tests were very, uh, Interesting to see the, the IP tables raw mode is added because raw mode kicks in very early. Um, so to just give a edge to IP tables, we try to uh, see how how it fares well with the similar technology because XTP uh, comes in kicks in very early. So uh, we had to make sure that yeah uh, we had a good amount of uh, competition. So there is a BPO filter branch that is in the uh, upstream kernel. Uh, which is trying to uh, uh, convert IP tables uh, rules internally to BPF via JIT. So any uh, network vendor such as Mellanox supports it. Uh, I think BNXT as well. Not sure, but yeah, Mellanox I'm sure. Uh, and then uh, you can you can get to see XTP hooks and TC hooks, and you will see uh, a lot of performance uh, with the uh, 
IP tables and if you're running Kubernetes application, you're, you're, you hope to see a lot of performance boost there. Um, so in routing case, uh, there was a, a kernel function added, uh, which is the FIB lookup, that is the forward information base, uh, which does the routing and then you have, uh, your, your packets will, uh, uh, your kernel will try to read the uh, table there and decide where to forward the packet. Um, with XTP, uh, people did a prototype and uh, with the normal user stack, we, they were able to do 1.9 uh, packets per second for the forwarding. Uh, but with XTP, they were able to get seven, uh, seven, 7 million packets per second. That is a lot of boost with just uh, 345 lines of uh, uh, changes. And then uh, Facebook is working on I think already released, it's an open source project called Katran. Uh, it's a solution for layer three, layer four load balancer. Um, and XTP can also be used as a one-legged load balancer. What that means is that you don't have to have a system for a load balancer, an entire system for a load balancer, which would save you money. Um, you can run it on the system itself, which is running the application because it will be very early in the stack. So you, you will ha it will be less invasive. Um, yeah. So regarding monitoring, I've talked about networking because my focus is on networking, but uh, monitoring is a very interesting topic. I think many people are interested in that. Um, Prometheus, uh, I discussed with uh, with Gotham yesterday about uh, eBPF exporter. There is a Prometheus exporter um, that does that. What you do is you give the eBPF code to uh, uh, Prometheus and it will collect that information and it really ingests it back to Prometheus so you can analyze that. Um, and then one interesting thing I got to know with Sapnil, uh, his talk was before me. Um, so they, uh, this, this program is very simple. Basically what it's trying to do is uh, get the information of all the IP address that's uh, uh, there. Uh, uh, that's making a new connection, right? Um, so the, uh, if you have attended the skimming talk, by Arjun, uh, he mentioned uh, uh, like you might not know what what all the calls are made outside your uh, uh, once once it's point when the JavaScript file is poisoned, poisoned or changed or modified. So it will make a call outside your trusted uh, uh, IPs. Um, so using this, uh, you can try to uh, find okay someone uh, is not uh, your maybe your JavaScript dependency is. Uh, Sending data outside that you not that you're not aware of, um, yeah. So this is a debugging tool, but you can also use it as a monitoring tool. And uh, this gives the AS info as well. That means uh, the uh, autonomous system from where the uh, connection is coming from. Uh, yeah. So the BPF uh, ecosystem is uh, growing and it's very active. Um, Six months ago, it was something else. Right now, it's something. And six months afterwards, it will be totally different. So my talk will be absolute. My job will be absolute, maybe. <laughs> um, so a couple of interesting things that people are doing. Uh, I just mentioned networking and tracing. It, I, as I mentioned, that it's eating up the software world. It's uh, coming up everywhere. If you are aware of Fuse file system, it's used in cluster, uh, Ceph as well. Um, so Somebody tried to do a bit of research and research work and they, uh, what they try to do is, it's a user space file system, that means it has to do a lot of context switches. So with eBPF, they did all the, uh, avoided all the context switches and uh, got a lot of performance boost as well. Uh, with Android, you can uh, remotely monitor Android devices. So usually the Android kernel is not that, uh, you cannot modify easily, you have to root and all that stuff. With But with uh, eBPF, you can extend that curl uh, kernel and add more features that uh, that are not there or you cannot add with software uh, directly into the kernel. It has to be merged in the kernel but with uh, the DBPF you can extend it by adding feature and then there is uh, one in another interesting thing, uh, IR decoding, infrared decoding that uh, somebody uh, added to the kernel. Um, so the, the, the diversity of uh, things that people are able to do with DBPF is Magnif uh, very, very uh, large. So I'm reaching the end of the talk, uh, almost within 30 minutes. Um, so you need to 
get the updated kernel so that you can play around with eBPF. Um, check out the BCC tool as well. Um, there is uh, XTP tutorial as well, so you can if you if you want to try out. Uh, um, you have if you have any use case specific to networking, uh, such as load balancing or routing, you can play around with that and see uh, how it how it work with work with your system. Maybe you want to change uh, masquerade something. Uh, but you don't want to use IP tables, which would be uh, a lot of overhead. Um, you can do that. Um, tracing, networking, um, security as well for SecComp. If you want to add, uh, yeah, make sure your system is secure. Yeah. These are some of the resources. But the first, but the first one is uh, it's a compilation, so you can get most of the details there. Uh, yeah, thanks so much. Any questions? How does BPF help in reducing context which is in Fuse? Fuse because uh, the you have the just check out the link first. Um, so what they what they're trying to do is they uh, the it's it's happening inside the kernel, right? So uh, the communication with the block devices and all that it uh, say you have to do a lot of uh, aggregation. So that that. Uh, Instead of doing uh, multiple context switches, you can aggregate and then send the data or cache it, something like that. So, um, in the sense that you will not, uh, so you would you ever end up modifying data being read as part of uh, a system call using BPA? That's a good question, but uh, to be frank, my expertise is on the networking side. That's why. I mean, even with networking, I was thinking. So, with networking, it's possible that you'd be, uh, you know, redirecting your packets to some place, maybe. Uh, that's yeah. one possibility. That's possible. Uh, Redirect. 